switch to English and this is the official name of the course micro nanotechnologies this is fall 2010 the goals of the the goals of this course is to teach you technologies of micro and nanofabrication and the principles behind the technologies so for example I'm going to teach you lithography I'm going to teach you how to uh, project image and project microstructures but I will also teach you the physics behind the fabrication which is basically the role of this course is not just to tell you if you do this you get that if you go to the lab and do use photoresist to use some technologies and you will get a nice and beautiful microstructure the role of this course is to give you the physics and the chemistry and the material science behind the microfabrication which is a little problem because it requires from you knowledge in many many topics for example when we talk about lithography and we are going to use a software which is called Prolith and Prolith is the standard software in the industry today I would say that more than 90% of the companies are using this software so this software in order to understand lithography you need to know how to use lens how to use how to project light how the light is propagating how the light hits an, hits an optical element you have to understand concepts like focal distance or op, uh, concepts like curvature of the length of the lens you have to understand concepts like what is a focus because the opposite of focused image is out of focus and you have to understand uh, properties like resolution resolution is what is the smallest element that you can print if it, is it today in the industry when you buy a computer and it's 45 nanometers the resolution is 45 nanometers but you, I'm going to show you that it's much more complicated because most of the optical system that we use are non-coherent so you have to understand a little bit what is coherent light what is non-coherent when we talk about lithography you have also to understand what is a photoresist how you project the image and convert the image into a pattern so you have to understand a little bit uh, electroactive uh, uh, sorry uh, optical polymers or uh, optical active polymers or photopolymers so all the things I will explain it to you and it's presented in a basic level which will allow you to use it uh, you're not going to be experts in photoresist you're not going to be experts in metallurgy but you will, I'm going to bring you an overview of all the basics some of you that will continue and will use it for your thesis or for your research will have to study each item which I'm going to bring in more details so I'm also give you information about tools and methods a very important issue is metrology metrology is the, uh, the how you measure things if you grow an oxide how do you measure the thickness of the oxide if you project an image of 45 nanometer how do you know it's 45 nanometers so some of you will say no problem I will use a microscope but imagine that you work in a company and you produce every day a few hundred wafers and every wafer has millions of transistors how do you measure millions, transi uh, millions of transistors very rapidly and automatically for example so I will teach you a little bit how do you do automatic measurements how to extract information from images because this is also part of the science of processing and the last lecture the last two lectures actually will be trends and prospects I'm going to teach you about future processes and some of them will work some of them will not some are speculations some are, uh, are based on more realistic but this is it now let's go to the syllabus I will, I will very briefly show you the syllabus yes the name of the pro software is Prolith P-R-O-Lith L-I-T-H and it's unfortunately it's commercially available but it costs a lot 
few hundred thousand dollars per copy. So it's a little difficult for an average student to get a copy. However, we got a university got a license to do it, and each one of you, because you are a member of this class, you can use it as long as you're students, as, as long as you're students in Tel Aviv University and register to this class. You're allowed to use it free of charge. And we got recently the latest version of the software. We, every year they update it. The software is a commercial software. And it will allow you to simulate processes, which basically to run the process on the computer. You can do it from home if you do VPN and you register student and you use the university login. I know that my students found a way to log in from the house to do it legally. Uh, you just have to identify to be, uh, I think, I'm not sure if all the students can do it. You need to have an account which is registered in the university. Thank you. Use the Citrix, uh, I think so. But if uh, Asia will give you more details about how to use the software. But let's, we have time to do it. You are going to have two homeworks to do it, three few exercises. So it's, because lithography is the most important. We will, we will start with lithography after the introduction. Because lithography is the most important part of this class. Because everything starts and ends with lithography. You make a transistor. You make the junctions. You use lithography. You make the poly -ga polysilicon gate, you use lithography. You open contacts, you use lithography. You continue with the metal, you use lithography. Every, every time you manufacture an integrated circuit, you use the lithography at least 14 to sometimes to 20 times. So if you go to a fabrication facility, you will see that the section or the division of microlithography is the largest and the most costly and usually also the critical point because if you have problems in your lithography process practically you cannot proceed any step you need to do patterning patterning means the word in english patterning means to define a pattern to define a line to define a contact to define an array to def define a circle this is called patterning i'm going to teach you about optical lithography light sources high pressure mercury lamp I'm going to teach you about photoresist. So this part is optics, then a little bit chemical engineering. I will teach you how you model photoresist and how you link the ABC model. We call this model ABC. You don't, most of you are not familiar with this model now. However, I hope that during the class I will teach you, you will be more familiar with this model, which is the common model. Very important. Was, uh, we, we are going to spend some time on what's called FEM. FEM is Focus Exposure Matrix, which is a method which is used in the industry to define the best possible uh, image, the best possible structure that you can uh, project. And I'm, again, I'm giving you just the name. In a few weeks, you will know more about what is Focus Exposure Matrix. I'm going to teach you about tools in the next lecture, steppers, and then after this part, which is mostly microlithography, I'm going to teach you about more advanced tools, enhanced UV tools, electron beam lithography, iron beam lithography, X-ray lithography, soft litho, and scanning probe lithography, which are the tools for nanolithography. So the class will switch from optical lithography in the micro scale to optical lithography in the nano scale. And I will, I'm going to teach you in an organized way. First, we teach how to do big lines, then smaller lines, then smaller lines. And the end, we'll know how to arrange at the nano lines. And of course, metrology and process control and other methods. Other methods mean everything which I couldn't find exactly how to put it, which is in a collection of some interesting stuff. And nano lithography. Once we know how to do lithography, we start with the real thing. So first, if you want to make devices, MOS devices or bipolar devices, you need to make junctions. So I'm going to teach you about junctions, doping, junction formation, first ion implantation, principles, interaction, how to simulate the ion implantation. And ion implantation is a method where you take ions like boron and phosphor 
and you take the silicon wafer and you shoot the ion onto the silicon and the ion penetrates and once the boron or the phosphor is inside the silicon, it's a doping. It affects the electrical properties of the silicon. So we are, we are going to give you another software to simulate it. See, uh, this time the software is free and available over the internet. It's called SRIM, SRIM, developed in Canada. Everybody can use it. And the people there decided to... Prolith also started in university, but somehow it became commercial and now it's not open source. Iron implantation, it's open source now, so everybody can use it. Once we know to do iron implantation, the ions penetrate the silicon, we hit the silicon and the ions diffuse. And once the ions diffuse, we have to solve the diffusion equation. I'm going to show you what equation to, to use. And there are many, many non-linear effects. And the biggest problem in modeling junction is that the diffusion is not linear. Everything depends on everything. The diffusion coefficient depends on the concentration. The concentration depends on time. The concentration depends on the number of defects. The defect depends on the concentration. So one, I, I will try to organize this topic. I'm not going to describe it all. To teach you diffusion, to teach you how to make solid state diffusion can take the whole semester. So in about two hours or three hours, I'm going to give you kind of the highlights how to understand diffusion, not how to solve it. It's, it's much more than what I'm going to teach you. Again, this class is mostly about fundamentals. The most important technology for making junctions is rapid thermal processing. It's a technology where you take the silicon wafer, heat it to 800 degrees Celsius in about 5 seconds, stays there for 5-10 seconds, and then cool it down. If you do this, you can accelerate many, many processes and on, on the same time uh, anneal all the defects formed during the iron implantation. And because this technology is so important, I'm going to give you one hour lecture on how to heat things very quickly. Now, many of us use this because one of the best ways to heat up, to heat elements very quickly is to put it under very strong lamp. If you buy french fries, chips, you know, sometimes people use very strong lamp, lamp to keep them warm. So one way to heat up silicon wafer is to put it under a very strong lamp. And I'm going to show you the physics. How do you eliminate, illuminate silicon wafer and this light absorbs and is converted to heat. Next is oxidation. Rapid thermal processing or RTP in short. It's heating, it's a, how to heat things very fast and also in a very controlled way. I mean, it's, sometimes it's very easy to heat, you just put it in flame, but it's uh, not a good idea because it's not controlled. Imagine that you take a silicon wafer with a diameter of 30 centimeters and I want it to go to 800 degrees plus minus one degree all over the wafer in five seconds. So this is what I'm going to teach you how to do it, or explain to you. Then oxidation, thermal oxidation and gate formation. The next steps is how to make, how to deposit layers, how to grow oxide. Next lecture is how to deposit material. Principle of chemical vapor deposition and epitaxial growth, polysilicon, silicon dioxide, silicon nitride are the three materials we're going to study, and we're going to study gas phase deposition, epitaxial growth, CVD, chemical vapor deposition, and also atomic layer deposition. This is new. Uh, this one I did not teach last year, so this is a new topic. The next, so this is general, how do you do gas phase deposition? The next step is how do you make contacts? And contact is usually made by metals, but also with a combination of metal and silicon. If you put aluminum, or you take nickel, or you take cobalt, or titanium, which are metals, and you put them directly on silicon, and heat it up to uh, some temperature, for example nickel is 350 degrees, titanium is like 550 degrees, if you heat it to that temperature, nickel and the, nickel and the silicon will react. Titanium and the silicon will react, and you will get 
titanium silicide or nickel silicide, which is an alloy. Now, those alloys were a breakthrough about 20 years ago because they make what we call an intimate contact. If you put a metal on the silicon, sometimes you're not sure the metal is touching. But if the two metals react chemically and you make an alloy between the two components, then you are sure that the metal is touching the silicide, which is touching the silicon. So you have an intermediate layer. You have silicon, metal silicide, and metal on top, which is today the best and the only way that people use for contacts. People don't do just metal silicon contacts. They make silicon, silicide, metal contacts. That's why I'm going to dedicate a complete lecture to silicides and silicide formation. Mostly the most common in the industry are cobalt, titanium, and nickel silicide. Although there are silicides for all metals, but those three metals, cobalt, titanium, and nickel, are the one which most people use, and they are a very good example. The next lecture is metallization and interconnect materials. I'm going to see it actually, we separate it into uh, we separate into the physical how to deposit metal by a method called physical vapor deposition. Second is electrochemical deposition. And third is electroless plating. I'm going to highlight all the methods. We are going to show you how do you deposit aluminum and copper. How do you deposit barrier layers? What is exactly a barrier layer? Why do you need barrier layer? Why you just Copper is a very good conductor, so you can use copper. But copper also diffuses very good into many, many places, which you don't want the copper there. So you have to confine, you put around the copper like a shell, a very thin shell of a metal, we call it a barrier. So I'm going to show you how to do it. The two common ones are tantalum, tantalum nitride, sorry, it should be capital N. I should fix this. Tantalum nitride and capping layers. So we have a few lectures about deposition, how we deposit by all many methods. The next step is how we etch. So I'm going to show you wet etch, how to etch in liquids. It's very simple. You take a very strong acid, you can etch. If you want to etch oxide, you can use, for example, hydrofluoric acid. Question, how do you use hydrofluoric acid in the lab? We don't use it because it's too aggressive. It's too difficult to work. So I'm going to give you kind of a review how to etch metals, why we use, for example, ammonium fluoride for etching oxide and not just HF. So this part is, we are going back to chemistry. It's kind of a kitchen chemistry. And uh, it's a lot of knowledge. Again, I cannot, uh, I don't have time to show you all the processes. So I'm going to highlight some examples. The next is extremely important is the dry etch. Dry etch is etch material in gas. You want to etch silicon, you shoot the fluor ion on the, with the silicon, then silicon reacts with fluor. You shoot another ion, another ion, and another ion, then you generate silicon tetrafluoride, SiF4. SiF4 is the gas, the gas is going out. So one way to etch silicon is to make it, to react it, with fluoride, or with chloride, or with iodide, or with bromide. So again, it's a gas phase chemistry. To some of you, this will be more difficult. To some of you, it will be simpler. But again, I try to make it a very basic chemistry. So chemistry, if you don't know very well chemistry, it's not a big problem in this class, because this class is not about chemistry. This class is, I'm going to give you recipes. The next one is another uh, new lecture that I introduced this year. It's called CMP, Chemical Mechanical Polishing. It's an interesting topic because it's a very dirty process. It's a very dirty process. You take a piece of some uh, slurry. Slurry is a mixture of water with powder. And this powder is aluminum oxide, which is a kind of a dirty, very dirty powder. You take the silicon and you rub it with some cloth, with some piece of, with a pad, is a polymer. And this polymer is sometimes made with a polymer very similar to what you have in your, uh, the tires of your car. It's polyurethane. If you take this polymer and this 
powder, powder mixed with water and you kind of polish the silicone, you can make it flat. Now why do you do it? I'm going to show you why we do it and why I would say that almost now 100% of the processes using this so-called dirty process in this technology which is supposed to be extremely clean. So we're going to discuss it. So I'm going to show what is a slurry, how do you know that you've etched the finishing and how you CMP, oxide, copper, polysilicon. Everybody now uses this technology, so I introduce it. It's, uh, the basic is very simple. You take a mixed powder with water, put it on the sample, and just rub it. Then you polish it. It's like if you, if you have silverware at home and you clean silverware, it's like brasso, some of this clean stuff that you clean silverware. If you don't have it, it's not a big deal. It's after, we, after I taught you, after teaching you the position and etching, we are going to teach about process integration, how you make transistors. I'm going to teach you regular transistor, which are MOS transistor process, and also new FinFET. FinFET is a nano transistor, which is a new concept, which we believe is a very important one. And a stressor. Stressor is how is a, it's a new method. Stressor is how to change the properties of the semiconductor by the process. And how do you change the process of this? How, if you have a silicon, you took class, some of you even took my class on silicon, you know that the mobility of electron and silicon, do you remember the number? Somebody remember the, what is the mobility of silicon, of electrons in silicon? And we all tell you that this is a God-given number, we cannot change it. This is the number. Wrong. You can change it. How do you change it? If you take the silicon wafer, and apply a very strong force on the wafer, really a very strong force, the wafer contracts a little bit. A little bit. Maybe 10, 1 promille. Very, very small number. Very small value. But if you do this, you change the distance between the silicon atoms, and you change the band structure, and you change the mobility, and you can sometimes increase the mobility by a factor of 2 or a factor of 3. This is called high mobility transistors, and all the companies now are introducing such process into manufacturing and we are going to, I'm going to show you some interesting process. Next is backend processes. Backend is uh, some reliability issue like voids and electromigration, planarization, interconnect and metrology, uh, how do you measure layers and again a new topic which I introduced in this year is 3D integration. 3D integration is a new topic uh, not going to tell you much about it now, but we believe that in the next few years everybody will use this technology. It's very simply, today you take a silicon wafer and you make all the devices on the plane of the wafers, on the surface of the wafer. So today we process in two dimensions. We have now new technologies to start to build transistors also in this dimension. And I'm going to show you how it's... This, people work on this for the last 40 years. It's, it will solve a lot of problems. So far, people didn't use it because it was too expensive. But now it becomes possible, and I'm going to show you a little bit about three-dimensional integration. The last lecture will be advanced CMOS process. How do you make a nano CMOS process? And I'm going to teach you something which is uh, very... I'm going to teach you a little bit about this ITRS, ITRS International Technology Roadmap of Semiconductors. And they have a, it's, an, it's a kind of a virtual body, actually not so virtual, it's a committee, but they have a site in the virtual space in the internet and this site is called itrs.net and if you go to this site you will find all the facts about processing of semiconductors and also what people believe will be the process next year, two years, three years, up to I think 17 years from now. It's a website which uh, people put there all the forecasts about future of semiconductor technology, microprocessing and nanoprocessing. It's a very interesting website I'm going to teach you about the ITRS. 
it's, I would say, sometimes it's very difficult to talk about forecasting as facts. But the problem is that if you do forecasting, it helps you to understand which points to work more hard, to work harder, and which points to work less hard. So I'm going to teach it. It's an interesting concept, and that if you sum all the hour, I put here all the sum of all the minutes. This is about ten lectures. In addition to, I'm going to give you ten lectures. We are going to have two guest lectures by Nuri from Intel. Nuri is one of the managers of Intel. He, uh, we studied in the same uh, lab in the Technion, and he became a, a manager in Intel. And he class, he gives every every year he gives few lectures, and he's uh, very interesting lectures because he takes what I teach, but shows you how it's been done in practice. So it's uh, the lectures will be in November, in the last part of November, I think November 21 and 28, I'm not sure exactly, but the last two weeks, so the last two lectures in November will be given by Nuri. It's a kind of half of the semester, we decided it's a good time. And also, uh, I would like to tell you that November 8, there will be no lecture, I will give you, I will put on the web, I will give you a warning before uh, there will be no lecture at all. So this is it, these are the books, everything will be on the website. Those are the books. We have a lot of them in the library. The best, I like the one of Stephen Campbell and John Plummer and Wolf. And uh, my book came very recently, but it's mostly on the metallization part. So those are the, those are, this is it. Let's save it and go to the introduction. Now the introduction is I'm not, again, I'm not showing all, you have to get used that I'm not showing all the slides in the lecture. It's, there's some redundancy, some slides I introduced for you just as a background. And before we start, questions. Okay. Are all the processors relevant only to silicon? Uh, mostly for silicon. Uh, however, um, the lithography is relevant to everything. Lithography processes is re are it's a good question. It's oriented towards silicon. However, it means that when I teach diffusion, for it, when I teach lithography, it's relevant to everything. When I teach CVD, it relevant to everything, but the examples will be for silicon technology. <coughs> Etching will be mostly silicon. Uh, metallization is relevant to gallium arsenide, indium antimonide, all other semiconductors, because I'm teaching uh, basic principles. Silicides are for silicon. What can you do? It's silicide. So the answer to your question is, it's, I'm teaching the general principles, but most of the examples will be for silicon. And I did it first because it's, uh, I needed some from the... Uh, from the teaching point of view, I want something to run all, over all the lectures, just one line connecting all the lectures. So the motto in this class is I'm teaching you general processes, focusing on silicon, so at the end of the lecture, at the end of the class, for sure you know how to, if you are you know, stuck in the middle of the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an island by yourself and somebody asks you to do a silicon process, you can do it. However, if you work for a company making infrared detectors, uh, you're using indium antimonide or mercury cadmium telluride, or you make lasers, you still use the same technology. It's very similar. Semiconductors are similar. Uh, compound semiconductors are more complicated. Uh, diffusion, more defects, is more complicated. Oxidation is a problem. Uh, there's no silicidation, so the contact is a problem. Uh, it deserves a lecture by itself, and I hope that in next year or I will write, I will have a graduate class, which is, I did my PhD on two six semiconductors, so for a few years I suffered, so I, I'm going to give all, I, I'm, I'm planning to have a, I'm planning, ah, okay. I'm planning to have something which is more oriented to 
two six and three five semiconductors, hopefully next year. So advanced. Ken, yes. Mm, not so much, because they use the same processes as with uh, uh, one or two-dimensional uh, silicon devices or other devices use the same processes. So I, I decided to focus more on conventional devices, not so much on, because the, the focus of this class is on the process, it's not on the devices. First computer, I think, some of you took my class in VLS, I saw some of the slides. The first electronic computer, vacuum tubes, which I'm sure that... Uh, is there anybody in the class that worked with... I think in, still in the Air Force there are some old tools using it. High, high quality stereo devices still use it, that's true. Uh, but it's so if you look at the history of solid state electronics 19th, end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century people use semiconductors to detect radio signals people use them as rectifiers the FET concept patent by a guy named Lilienfeld 1925 about 20 years before people actually made transistors and I put your transistor invented, actually it was reinvented, and the Nobel Prize went to Berdin, Britain, and Shockley. Then the 1952, the FET devices, 1958, the Kilby and Noise, each one separately, Kilby in Texas Instrument, and Noise in Fairchild Semiconductor, produced the first integrated circuit. And interesting is that basically uh, you can see that 1958, these were modern microelectronics started. So it's only 50 years, only 52 years this science exists. So it's a relatively young science. And this is why a lot of things as we speak are being investigated and a lot of things are not so well understood even now. And as dimensions became smaller and smaller, it became more and more of a problem. So CMOS logic invented in 63, and the self-aligned MOSFET process uh, was invented here. By the way, it's an interesting part. We always find the Jewish connection, but here is the Israeli connection. Professor Joe Shapir from the Hebrew University, which was master, my master advisor, he actually, his name is on the first patent of CMOS that was issued uh, by Philips. So he's, uh, he has his name in history. I managed to get this terrible picture. Very, uh, even, even if you uh, sh clo close the light, it's very difficult. This is a copy of the patent from 1930 on the MOS device. And this is a very famous picture of the, point of the uh, bipolar device that was developed in Bell Labs in 1947. This is a very famous picture. Uh, the invention of the device and even though first the MOS device was invent invented first and the bipolar device was invented second bipolar was more popular because it was very difficult to produce MOS devices only about 20 years later and this is the first transistor product and uh, actually it was invented in America and all we all know that Sony took this technology and transfer it. It's a little bit the history of Sony, the first company that make it commercial. And an interesting, the first microelectronic used germanium transistors. Germanium is a better semiconductor than silicon. Uh, devices are faster. Uh, you can make uh, junctions at lower temperature. It's, a, and it's an excellent semiconductor except one problem. It has very bad interface. If you take a piece of germanium and put it in air, it will react with air, or if you oxidize it, you generate germanium oxide, which is a terrible oxide. It reacts with the humidity of the air, it conducts, it's a bad insulator. 
On the other hand, silicon, if you put silicon, you oxidize it, you create silicon dioxide, which is an excellent insulator. So we all use silicon not because it's a better semiconductor, but it's, it has much better oxide. By the way, this, this is a picture of the first integrated circuit. It actually was an oscillator circuit on a germanium substrate. It has few transistors, and this thing oscillates. Looks pretty awful. And they got the Nobel Prize for it. I think these are the first engineers to get, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they are the first engineers to get a Nobel Prize. Not many engineers get Nobel Prize. So I, sorry? They were before? Okay. Uh, I will have to correct. Then bipolar devices in the 60s, and the introduction of the CMOS process in uh, about in the in the 60s, in the end of the beginning of the 70s, this is a junction, a junction, polysilicon gate, and a contact. So this is a process of the CMOS process. Uh, if you go to a fabrication site, if you go to companies like Intel or Tower Semiconductors in Israel or any company in the world, do you see this picture? Okay, do you want to turn off the light? on the back side. Do you see this picture? Is it okay? This is a clean room. If you go to an engineering building, you see another clean room, which is not that quality. But these are the pieces of equipment which are processing what I'm going to teach you in this class. This is how it looks. Uh, the interesting part, if you go to a fabrication site, all equipment look the same cameras, furnaces, everything look like big boxes. So doesn't, when I show you this class, when I show you these rooms, it can be anything, but you have to trust me. But if you look, you see one interesting part here, not many people. If you just look at this fabrication facility, in a typical fabrication facility, and this is a wet edge section, I took it from a, one of the companies, one of the local companies, this is where they do the wet etching. You see one or two people running the machine. Everything is automatic. Everything is robotic. Because people are the main source of contamination. We are shedding particles. We, use, we have sodium in our hands and chloride. Humans, evolution uh, is not the best. We are not so clean as we think. So people are dressed in like uh, astronauts. And uh, everything is automatic. All the wafers, actually, if you look... Very carefully, you see on the ceiling these little things. All the wafers are actually flow, uh, moving near the ceiling, go down to the machine, running the process, go back. And the reason near the ceiling, there are, if the room is practically, there are not many particles in the room. But if there are particles, there are, in the ceiling there are less particles because the particles are usually going down. So the, near the ceiling is the cleanest place in the room. So usually we move the wafers near the ceiling. This is the early sum integrated circuits and I'm going to skip this. If you go to the, uh, what are the limits that we can manufacture today, what are the limits of lithography? This picture is reprinted from uh, one of the uh, uh, images that IBM produced. They produce uh, an image where they deposited very tiny layers, very tiny dots of metal. Each dot is few nanometers in dimension. And you can guess the name of the company. But this is called nanolithography. They deposit this point of metal using a scanning probe tool. They took a probe of metal, put it close to the surface, and a very tiny drop of metal was deposited. So this is called nanolithography. That's are the limits of lithography. If we go to the processes, and I'm, I will run quickly, in, initially people used junction devices, and the method was very crude. They took a s semiconductor, N semiconductor, then P, and then N. And the way they grew it, they grew it from a liquid and added... To make it n-type, they put some phosphorus, and then they stopped and put some boron, and then they stopped. So when you grow the crystal from the melt, you can have a structure which like this. And then you cut all the excess material, 
and you cut this into pieces and you get NPN device, which is a bipolar device. Now this process was the early process people used in the 50s and you can see this is a, a big waste of material because you waste most of the crystal. You, waste of, you use only a tiny fracture of the material. So next step, they instead of making NPN like this, they cut, they took a, a big crystal of N-type semiconductor, cut it to slices, these slices are called wafers, and then put here a little dot of indium, a little dot of indium, and indium, if you alloy indium with silicon, it becomes P-type, and then it becomes PNP. So this was the alloy junction transistor. It was a big improvement, because you, first you can use more silicon wafers, second, you can control much better the dimension. And one of the critical conclusions of this class is one of the most important parameters is the dimension. Either the, this dimension or this dimension, the width of the structure or the length of the device, and controlling the dimension is extremely important. In 1958, people produced, I wanted to remember the name, planar. Planar was a, the revolution. Now everything we use planar, but the first planar process was in Fairchild in 1958. And here, this is the first process that demonstrated the concept of modern uh, micro and nanotechnology. You take the surface of the surface, you take the semiconductor, and everything is processed on the surface. You take the surface of the silicon and you grow and oxide on top. And I'm going to teach you how we grow an oxide, what are the equations, what is the model that describes oxidation. Next, you open a hole. To open a hole, you need to do lithography. You have to define where you want to open, you have to etch the oxide, you have to remove all the dirt around it and have, the, have it open. Next, you have to dope this area so you can introduce p-type into the end type. For example, if this contained phosphorus, you introduce boron. And you notice that while growing the p-type layer, we also oxidize the surface. Next step, we open here a contact, and again we diffuse a little bit of phosphorus inside, and this is called the double diffuse bipolar device. This was the winner device in 1950s and the 60s. It was produced everywhere. This what made bipolar devices so popular in 1960s, even in the 70s. Some of you using uh, bipolar devices, are you using still TTL devices in the lab, undergraduate? Are there some electrical engineers in the room? Electrical engineers in the room? You still use TTL, right? TTL, transistor, transistor logic is this technology of double diffuse device and we still use it. It's still, it's extremely cheap and it's working. <laughs> yes? No. It affects, yes. It's part of the problem but it affects the mobility and the, the major, the, this process produced wonderful devices. The only problem if you see this device, this device was very small here but very large from here to here. So you, 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 can, you can produce a wafer with 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, 10 million transistors. It's very difficult to make a real circuit with hundred or hundreds of, or hundreds of millions of bipolar devices. It's, it, became, it was very difficult. This is why people switched. And Okay, this is the bipolar pair devices where you put a P device and N device and P, uh, this is an NPN device, this is a device which acts as a resistor, so you can actually make a transistor, and th this was very popular 30 years ago. Today we don't use it, or at least uh, we use it but only for old devices. The modern processors are CMOS. And the, the reason why CMOS is a winner, this is the bipolar devices, the NPN device, and this is the CMOS or the MOS device when you have P, N, P, but the contact, the conduction is on the surface. Can't see. Sorry, I see. Yeah. You see, 
this this is an M, this is a this is an MOS device, and this device you have P on the N substrate and a gate. So the conduction of the current is between the P here to the P here on the surface. While in a NPN device, in a bipolar device, the conduction is from here to the bottom. So one of the problems in bipolar device is the bottom is common to all the devices. So if you want to make a complicated circuit, it's a short, but you have to be a little tricky how to make complicated circuits because all the circuits share the same substrate. It can be done, but it's a limit. It's a limit for the designer. And for MOS devices, you take a region, you dope it with N. Next to it, you put another region, dope it with P. Now, if this region is N and this region is P, what do we have between the two regions? NP junction, which is an insulator. So we can put many, many regions on the same wafer. That's why we have, for the designer point of view, it's more flexible. We can make devices of P type, N type, and we can organize them in a much better way. But the most important part is the bipolar device. Is a, it's a large device. The CMOS, we can make this much, much smaller. And the last issue is that in an MOS device, the gate is insulator. There is no current flowing. If you look at the structure, it has N. It's a, this is a P device. This is an N device. This is a control gate. In the control gate, there is no current flowing. And if we connect CMOS, which is a PMOS and an MOS together, there is no conduction when there is no signal. I believe most of you uh, took classes of, uh, let's, let's rephrase it, some of you didn't take the class of basic circuits because some of you are not from the electrical engineering. So I will try not to focus too much on the circuits part. However, you have to remember, people make electronic circuits at the end. So you have to understand a little bit the impact of the process on the circuits. Again, it's not a big issue in this class, but I will try to give you a little bit the effect on the circuit. So this is how it looks. This is a cross-section in a CMOS process. And it's very careful. The, the, the actual transistors are here. Can you turn off the light? Because it's, it's more. I want, I want complete dark. Ah, the the name. It's the both sides. Okay. You can see here. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't. If you look very careful, you can see here the transistors. Okay. Now open the light. <laughs> it's very difficult. If you t the one of the problems in a semiconductor processing that it's very difficult to see the image of the transistors. Because P-type semiconductor and N-type semiconductors look the same. It's just silicon. However, this is tungsten, which is a conductor. This is aluminum, which is a conductor. We can separate them. We can see them. So it's very easy to see the wires and to see the contacts. And if, if you ever hear a transistor, and you see also that and this is an old process, by the way. This process is 15 years old or something. But even in this process, you can see, you have much more or many more wiring than transistors. For every transistor, you have here like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven components, contacts, wires. And this is, and this is an old process with one, two, three, four levels of metallization. Modern process, people use eight levels. And the reason, the more levels you have in this dimension, you can make more interconnect and you can make more complex electrical design. And also, if you, you have here some signal. And the signal wants to go from here to here. If the signal goes this way, between here and here, you have high capacitance. If the signal go, for example, like this, 
between here and here you have much lower capacitance. So some, sometimes by a par, it's a paradox, but if you take the signal, the longer way it actually will go faster. Because the, if you want to take the signal from here to here, sometimes it will be much faster to route the signal up here, ship it to here, go down, it will be faster even the path is a little longer. Because what matters is the capacitance between the elements. Because you know, the speed of the circuits depends on the size of the capacitance. Small capacitance, fast circuits. Large capacitance, slow circuit. So today people make more and more layers. You want to make faster and faster circuits. And interesting, the power consumption of the chips also depends on the capacitance. High capacitance, high power. Low capacitance, low power. So today the, the, the demand is low, low. low power. You want this to last like one week? I wish. This, uh, this one is back to the stone age. After eight hours it's gone. And this structure, if you want to save power, you actually route the signals away. So you build more layers to reduce the capacitance, because if you reduce the capacitance, you save power. But there's a trade-off. You make more layers, the circuit is more complicated. It costs more. So you understand now the constraint of the engineer, because we have performance, which is power and speed and cost. What we want is the fastest circuit, the lowest power, and the cheapest chip. Uh, but it's a contradiction. It's so this is the CMOS process. This is review of the dates, Mulo. I yes, Ken. Uh, we have a break in 15 minutes. Okay. I want to finish this section, and so we can move on. I want to finish the introduction. There are two more issues I would like to stress. Because the question you may ask me: Why should we try to make smaller? Structures. Why should why I'm, I'm, t I'm teaching you the stru uh, processes and more advanced processes and advanced 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 processes? Good example is the Intel family, the x86 family. This is a 4004 vintage 1971. Even I, even I was in high school. Then, then the Pentium in 1994, and then the layout of this device, the Pentium 4, 1999. And if you plot, if you plot the number of transistors versus year of the Pentium family, of the x86 family, they all fall in straight line, which shows that average increases 2x every almost two years. And this is the famous Moore's law, and this is the famous uh, drive, or the, the most important drive that we have in the industry. This goes up till 2000, but if you continue it, it continues until 2010 and 15, and we believe it will continue at least 10 more years. So, the, the, this was for microprocessor, this is for DRAM. If you plot the capacity of DRAM in kilobyte versus year, you get a straight line, and this is in a log scale here, and linear scale. It's a a rule of thumb, it's, a, it's not a law like the gravitation law, but it's a law of life. This is how things work. They become faster. You can put, in 19, 2001, you can put a whole encyclopedia, and uh, we can now put a complete human memory or human DNA on one chip. The die size, the size of the chips is also growing, although not so much. They grow like 40% every, every year. But chips are become bigger and bigger and bigger, which is a problem, by the way, because packaging is a problem now. The clock frequency, if you plot the clock frequency, you can see that in the first, between 1970 to 1980, clock frequency went... My first PC, I'm, I'm a slightly older than you, my first PC was a clock of about 4.7 megahertz. It was, this was a state of the art. Then it was the 8080 in 8086. Then you see what happens. In, in about between 1980, 
1990, for almost 10 years, speed didn't go so much, and one of the problems was, uh, uh, it was a, there was a lot of technology issues which I'm going to show you, and what happens in 1990 suddenly, speed went up, and I don't have a, a continuation of this slide, but what will happen now, speed saturated, not because we cannot make it faster, uh, but, but because of the next issue, which is power dissipation. What happens, power dissipation reach a level of more than 10 watts per chip. And you have to remember, if you take a chip and you apply put bias and there is current, you have, it heats up. We, in, a normal, in, in the normal packaging system, if you package the device, put all the contacts, put it on a PC board, the best we can dissipate today is in the range of 50 to 100 watts per centimeter square. If you go to normal packaging, normal packages, the best you can buy today with all the tricks and heat in fans and cooling and air cooling, it's 50 to 100 watts per centimeter square. If you go to water cooling and liquid cooling is a different issue. What you don't want to have with your computer a complete water cooling system. So what happens in about 1990, about the year 2000, people reach this level. And what happens, you can see now that people don't make, at least for many consumer products, much higher frequency because of the power issue. So I'm going to teach to to, to basically to, and if we talk about power density, uh, basically in about 1992 was like a hot plate, and today, uh, if, we, if, if we would extrapolate, this was 20, if we would extrapolate, uh, we reach 1,000 watt per centimeter square, then it will, be, it will be like a rocket nozzle, which is impossible. So this extrapolation is wrong. And today, most of the systems remain in the range of this value, 50, 60, 70 watts per centimeter square. This is what you can buy for common. It's, 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 it's pure thermodynamics. If you flow air over a surface, there is a certain amount of heat you can dissipate. And if the air flows faster, you have a boundary layer, then it's again a problem. So this is from, it's, practic it's practical. Uh, and the last slide which I'm going to show you today for the introduction is to encourage you a little bit. But you have to pay attention to this transparency. It's a little complicated. I took it from a, actually from a report which is not exactly electrical engineer, but this is more from a, a report on the economics of the, is the, our industry. We have two lines here. One line is the complexity. Complexity is logic transistor per chip. And if you look at the complexity of chip, and I, I took it for some, uh, to make things fair, I took it for some co uh, product which goes over like 20 years. This specific one, I, 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 th th this one is not from Intel, this one is from the ITRS roadmap. They took a product which started in 1985, and this product ended uh, about here. And the number of the complexity of this line increased by about 58% a year. And this is very typical to all products. All products, they become more and more complex. You want more functions. You want MP3, and you want wireless, and you want this, and you want that. Things become more complicated. And the average growth of complexity of chips is 40, 50, 60, 70% per year. However, you look how many engineers you need to design it, and how many engineers are graduating from universities every year. And you look, you calculate a number, which we call it productivity, is how many transistors a person can design per month. It's a crazy number, because what they did, they took how many transistors were produced, how many engineers produced it, and divided the two numbers. Which is, it's a little bit, uh, I would say, statistically, if, if there were statistics, if people here were a real statistician, I would be, but it's, it's a measure, but it's a fact. The fact is, we have a problem. This grows 21% a year. 
there are about five, uh, there are, every year we produce a little bit more engineers, but maybe 5% more. But every year, we have, you are much better students than we were, so you produce more. But on average, it's about 20% a year. Also, you are, you produce, you're, you're, you're using better software, you're using... So when you join the industry, in a few years from now, some of you are already working, you are doing a much better job than it was 10 years ago, because you are using much better tools. But it's growing only 21% a year, which means, you know what the conclusion of this graph? The salary of designers is going upper and upper because there's a big demand for people working in semiconductor industry because the industry is growing much faster than the number of people that are graduating. So with this message, I think we can, this optimistic message, we can go for a break now. The introduction. Now we talk about... Lithography. Now, is the illumination correct? Do you see it or do you want to...? Okay. Uh, uh, this is the best. Okay. So... If you, this is like the reason for what we do. If you look at like non-flesh, now some of you are not electrical engineers, so this, all these acronyms. What is non-flesh? This is non is not end. End is the logic operation of that. If you take one end one. You got one only when, 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 when both are one. One and zero is zero, one and zero and one and one is, is zero, sorry. Zero and zero is zero. So if you want to make an, a logic operation of NAND, and the circuit is called flash, flash memory is a, is a kind of a memory that you can write the information, and the information will be stored. You erase it, you lose it. But you can store it for a few years, up to <coughs> practically more than, ten, more, more than 10 years. So this is non-flesh. A non-flesh made of, this, is, this, this technology is called X-Point. I will not go who is making it, but this is typical technology. This is polysilicon. This is the silicon. And... Here, if you take polysilicon over silicon, you make a transistor. And one of the things that I will have to explain a little bit more later is how we actually make a transistor. But you have to trust me that this is a transistor. So if you take a non-flash, if you look at it, uh, we have something that we call uh, F. F, or if some of you took my class in VLSI, we used to call it lambda. F is like the critical dimension of this device. So if this device is, this is one lambda, and oh, the, 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 from here to here we have about two lambda, and from here to here we have about two lambda, the total area is four, or sorry, if from here to here the size is 2F, from here to here, the size of 2F. F is like the half the size of the cell, or half the size of the minimum dimension. So the area here will be 4F square. And we can store 1 to 4 bits per cell. Normal cell, we store 1 bit, which is 1 or 0. But you can think of a cell that you store 0, 1, 2, 3, so you can see you have few levels of storing the information. You can store the charge, zero charge, one unit of charge, two units of charge, or three, three units of charge. So in this kind of a device, you can store, if you have four levels, how many bits you can store? 16, right. If you have two levels, you can store four. No, sorry. If you, have two, if you have one level, you can store one bit. If you have two levels, you can store four. Critical pattern is one, we call it 1D. 
and the critical pitch is very very dense. What is pitch? We use, by the way, pitch. We use, even when when we speak in Hebrew, we also call it pitch because there is no word in Hebrew for this. Pitch is the periodicity of the structure. This structure is one cell, second cell, third cell, and you can, if you look at it, it's, you see the periodicity. Periodicity in design, it's called pitch. Now, periodicity is extremely important because we never make a circuit with one bit. Processors are 32, 64, 128, 256 bits. Memories are uh, a lot of bits. So every, every case, every time we make integrated circuit, we have structures which are periodic. And you have to remember this, we never print a single line. We always print many lines. And the many lines have periodicity. So we have to understand, you have to re recall of the mathematics of periodic structures. You have to remember Fourier transform, you have to remember what is a Fourier series, because every time we discuss a little bit the physics and the mathematics behind the process, since we deal with the periodic structures, we always have something like frequency and, uh, and critical frequency and etc. So you have to understand a little bit what we call a complex analysis. But again, don't, be, don't worry, it's very basic. This is a dynamic memory, a DRAM. Dynamic random access memory. This is how it looks. Every cell here, in a flash we have one transistor per cell. Flash memory, we have one transistor per cell. In a dynamic random access memory, we have a transistor and a capacitor. We have a transistor, it's a switch, we charge a capacitor. Capacitor is charged, is one. Capacitor is uncharged, no charge, it's zero. So we can store the information. Now, because we have here a transistor and the capacitor, it is larger. The cell is 6 to 8 F square, one bit per cell, and it's very dense. And uh, what are the problems here is imaging and overlay. Now, what is imaging and what is overlay? Imaging is how to image the design. Because when you design, you design it on your board or in the computer. You have to take it and project it on the wafer. And we are going to show you in the next lecture what does it mean to project. Project means transfer the information through using light. It's like a camera. In a camera, you are projecting the image. If I take a camera of you, I project your image onto the camera. This is called projection. So uh, projection and imaging is a problem and overlay. Overlay is something which is extremely important because you, you never make just PN junction. You never make just gate. You make the gate and then you have to put... A, 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 sorry, you make the junction, then you have to define the contacts, so how do you put the contact? The error or the, 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 the engineering of putting layer over layer over layer and the, accuracy and the problems is called overlay problems. Overlay means all the engineering problems which are involved of putting layer over layer over layer. This is called overlay. In a static random access memory, we have typically six transistors per cell. Now, static RAM are useful, especially for cache memory, for the very fast memory inside the devices. <coughs> they are much larger, and they are one bit per cell, and uh, I will not go over what does it mean, what is K1, uh, because I, there is a parameter here which is called K1. In in one lecture, I'll go back and explain to you what is K1, what does it mean. But K1 is the parameter which tells us how good is the lithography, or how quality of the lithography required for this device. Now, I will skip this slide, this is ITRS roadmap. But let's go and give you what can we project today, give you a uh, the future of uh, of now of lithography half pitch what is the pitch again you have one line 
second line, third line, fourth line. And if you look at the periodicity of the structure, we call it pitch. If we have one line which is 45 nanometer, and the spacing is 45 nanometer, what is the pitch? 90 nanometer. So pitch is the periodicity of the structure. So this shows us what is the half pitch which we can produce today. So the pink one is the uh, C C CPU gate and the half pitch 2010 can be in the range of uh, Um, this is number is a little bit too good, like 12 nanometers. Uh, I have to figure out which line belongs to which lines because we have two, we have two lines here. So this is the if you so let's focus on the overlay and the DRAM. This number is I have to check it. You can see that today you can print 2010. We can print. Uh, dimensions in the range of 45 nanometers, half pitch. We expect the 2015 to print 32, uh, below 30 nanometers in the range of 22 nanometers. So this is what we expect to print in a commercial product, which means in universities and research lab we can print much smaller dimensions. So nanolithography can be achieved today in even in any university. Questions? No, not yet. It's I think the state of the art, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, is is about forty. Thirty eight, forty. You should know the number. Something like this. Twenty two is will be hopefully in two thousand fifteen if things will go well. This is half pitch. Half pitch means if I make transistor space, transistor space, transistor space, in the minimum I can compact, this is it. Now for DRAM is different than for CPU for, uh, for, uh, for logic. DRAMs are usually denser. This is why I'm a little bit worried about this pink line. And this is the half pitch. Now this is a CD, this is a CD uniformity, I think, this one. A cross wave. So forget this pink line, let's focus on what I... What you see, the pitch is getting better. And let's talk a little bit now how, how we can do it. How we can do it. How we can print such small lines. How we can print lines with such high density. So to understand this, we in the next few hours, and it takes about four to six hours, depends on the pace, I'm going to teach you lithography. So this is the first topic of this class. To understand lithography, you need to get four topics. First is exposure. How do you project the image from your design to the wafer? You can use light, you can use ele electrons, you can use uh, ions, you can use x-ray, to project, to transfer the information to the wafer. When the light or the electrons or other mode of energy reach the surface of the silicon or the semiconductor, you use a photosensitive polymer or electron sensitive polymer or x-ray sensitive polymer or a kind of a polymer which is sensitive or material which is sensitive and you change the properties of this material. So we call this component a resist. If this resist sensitive to light, we call it photoresist. If this is sensitive to electrons, we call it electron sensitive to X-ray, we call it X-ray resist. And this material we use to transfer the image from the light or the electrons to reality. Next, we need to develop it. Develop it is because usually when your polymer or your material interact with light, you build a latent image, an image inside the material which you cannot see. This image is information, but you need to expose it. You need to take information out. And the last issue, which is extremely important, is metrology. When you write lines, when you print dots, you need to measure it. And the reason is, 
that if you don't measure, you don't have a feedback in your process. You don't know the dimension. And it's critical to know the dimension because a fabrication facility, a company, is a very complex uh, entity. There are many, many machines and many people are working there. And if you are producing transistors of 45 nanometers, in next month it's 46, next month it's 47, and usually if things can go wrong, it goes. So you want to bring it back to be 45. But you need to know what is the dimension. This is part of the process. And I'm going to teach you not only how to produce lines, but how to design the best possible process. That it will be the most stable process. So what is lithography? The key to uh, micro lithography today is projection lithography. Projection lithography is when you take a mask. A mask is a piece of glass, typically made of quartz, high quality glass. This glass is coated with a very thin absorbing material. Very common to use chromium, but other materials are possible. And let's imagine a situation that you have a substrate, this is the silicon. On the silicon we put the blue layer and we want to remove some of the blue layer. So you sit on your drawing board and you design a square and you put this square on the mask. Now how to write the information of the mask is also done by lithography and I'm going to show you how to do it. But let's start from a point that I have a mask and on this mask I have a region which is opaque, transparent, opaque. So when I illuminate it I got here light, the blue is light, or you typically we use ultraviolet light. And the reason we use ultraviolet light because it has a very short wavelength, so we got better resolution. Here we put a lens, projection lens, so the light is coming here and is focused onto the wafer. So this area gets light. Photoresist is very sensitive to light. So this area, which absorbs the light, in some photoresist, we can remove it. Why? Because when we illuminate the photoresist, we change the properties. We can break it, we can make it soluble, we can change its properties. So once we develop, so this is called projection, where we change the properties of this region. Next is development, that we remove this material. Once we remove this material, for example, we can etch the blue material. Because now, if we put it in a very uh, corrosive environment, in a very corrosive, in a gas or in a liquid, we will etch this blue. And the last one, we don't need any more this photoresist material and we remove it. So what we got here, this is called etching. Or you can, we use other names. We use the name of pattern transfer we use the name of projection lithography. Now projection lithography, for example for silicon, we take a silicon substrate, on the substrate we put silicon dioxide, and then on top of it we put photoresist. Next we put the mask. If you put the mask, for example in this mask, if you look at this mask, the mask is made of a transparent material, but here in this area we put a a shape, like an L-shaped structure made of opaque, of metal. It's made of chromium, very thin layer of chromium. So if we, if we illuminate this structure, this area is shadowed, this area is not. Now we have two types of photoresist. We have negative photoresist and positive photoresist. Positive photoresist is a photoresist where, where you, you illuminate it, it's, it's gone. You illuminate the photoresist, the places which are illuminated are removed. So here, it was dark, we have photoresist, it was light, it's removed. So when we etch, we get the metal here, or the, the layer here, it can be oxide, can be metal, can be anything, the shape of the metal here. So we actually copied the shape. And because the shape is in the same shape of the shape on the substrate is the same as the shape of the mask, we call it positive. 
However, there are some other polymers which are called negative, 